Number of people I've killed in real life. F***ing zero. Allegedly. Welcome back to Business Blaze. I am your boy with the blaze. This one is, oh, I'm not wearing my own merch. Ah, I had the hoodie on. I recorded two videos in a row. Uh, by the way, okay, so look, winter's coming. Get yourself a hoodie. Uh, this one says, it's your boy with the blaze. Um, but there are hoodies in multiple designs available. So grab one of those. I throw it on the ground to represent what high quality, resilient material it is made out of. It's called fabric. It's good. And today's video is brought to you by Dashlane. More about their fantastic business offering in just a little bit. Oh yeah, this one. I don't even know what this one's about. Okay, so normally what happens on Business Blaze is Danny, the channel's writer, writes me a script and then I read the script to you and Sam adds some memes. But what has happened today is it was heavily it was requested in the comments and I I'm sorry, like I know I should credit people who come up with the ideas, but it's logistically tricky and uh, and, I and I'm lazy. So, but keep, keep giving me free ideas, everybody. <laughs> I'm a bad person. People were like, Simon, just have Danny write a script about anything. Don't, just don't let him tell you what it is. So, I have not read today's script. The only thing that the, the only thing that I've done to this script is write dash lane, pre-roll. And then somewhere in here, there's this thing that reminds me that I have to do a dash lane ad in the middle. That's all I know. Other than the fact that it's called the Business Blaze Mystery Box. So let's jump in. On February the 21st, 1848, the German economist and philosopher Karl Marx, Danny, if this is all about communism, I'm gonna be upset. <laughs> uh, he published the Communist Manifesto, of course he fucking did, which called for a working class revolt against capitalism. The little pamphlet has since gone down in history as one of the most influential documents of all time, which inspired the catchy, catchy slogan, workers of the world, unite. Don't even think about it, Danny. If you unite with Sam, I will crush you. I've read the Communist Manifesto, like every good capitalist should, and the whole time, all I'm thinking is like, this is fine, it's all fine. It's why capitalism is bad, but that's all. It's just like capitalism is bad because of this and this and this. And uh, we should take away the capital from the, the capitalists. It's like, okay, but I mean, I could, you know, that's it. <laughs> it's kind of disappointing. Smash that dislike button, communists. But to be honest, it would take several decades before anyone really gave a shit. By a startling coincidence, several decades is also the same length of gameplay that you're likely to get with Freak Shadow Legends. <laughs> Just so long as you keep throwing stacks and stacks of money at this freemium mobile classic. The only reason it's classic is because it's come a meme, because it sponsors everything. Except for any of my channels. And people are like, Simon, I've seen you do Raid Shadow Legends ads, and I'm like, I think I'd remember. And stacks and stacks of money is exactly how much Phil Collins has earned. Oh God, this is, Danny, is this script just memes? Is this script just OG Business Blaze jokes? This chat, we've got like 200,000 subscribers as of me recording this. Uh, I, I, probably where we're gonna stay, if I'm honest. Um, has a, tell a friend, by the way. Tell a friend how much you love blazing business with your boy. And uh, we'll get some more subscribers that way. And just warn them it's gonna be weird, but they'll get the in-jokes eventually, and then they'll like them, and they'll feel like they're in some sort of exclusive club with 199,999 other people. And your boy. So Phil Collins was up to something. Has earned by releasing music, which is probably best appreciated when it's being pumped into an elevator. There's something in the air tonight. Oh Lord! Uh, a manufacturing elevator, a malfunctioning elevator on fire, in which the soothing tones of Phil spitting out the speakers are the only thing to take your mind off the fact that elevator, the elevator is rapidly hurtling towards everyone, everyone towards a very sticky doom. <laughs> Danny, what is going on? Of course, I'm sure this is a very unlikely scenario. I did start considering writing a script on how many double amputee war veterans have perished in bizarre elevator accidents, as the jokes would practically tell themselves. <laughs> but I'm not convinced. But I'm convinced that elevator design is rooted in the core concepts of safety and reliability, and this got me thinking. Just what exactly is involved in the day-to-day -day working routines of a typical elevator designer? Oh, Danny, I still don't know what this is about. Your intros, bloody hell. Those elevator boffins are the unsung heroes of modern civilization. I started off thinking this was going to be all about communism. Then I thought it was going to be all about mobile games. Then I thought it was going to be about bad musicians. I quite like Phil Collins, but Yoko Ono. Ah! Most hero more heroic than Chuck Norris, Mr. Da Mr. T. David, more heroic than Chuck Norris, Mr. T. David Hasselhoff, and the farmer bro, 
all rolled into one tough-talking, super-fighting machine. Oh, well, I hope that Chuck Norris, Mr. T, David Hasselhoff get together and beat the shit out of the Farmer Bro, because as we've discussed previously, he has the most punchable face in the world. You'll be a ghost for real, more. That's not my joke. Someone commented, there's like a meme about him having a punchable face, but boy is it true. But maybe not quite up there with one of my all-time biggest heroes. And the hero I'm actually going to get around to talking about in this script perhaps became better known for his glorious failures than he did his spectacular triumphs. But he's still a hero in my eyes. The man is Sir Clive Sinclair, and welcome to an episode of Biographics. Uh, Biographics, if you don't know, is another channel I do where we do biographies. The, the naming was genius. There, I remember, I was doing some exercise one morning, and I was like, I really like bio, I read a lot of biographies, and I'm like, one of my favorite biographies, Arnold Schwarzenegger, is actually right back there. Um, and I was thinking, I was like thinking new channels always, you know, new channels, what to do, and I was like, I should do biographies, and it should be called Biographics. And I love the name so much that that's how the channel was born. We've briefly touched upon Sir Clive in previous Business Blaze episodes, in which we discussed the disaster of the Sinclair C5 and the brilliance of the ZX Spectrum. But I wanted to look deeper into the story of a man who is unquestionably a maverick genius and is widely regarded as one of the most influential British inventors of all time, and yet never quite seemed to get it right with the things that he actually cared about. It's not a story that involves fraud, or scams, or murder, or lawsuits, or prison sentences. Says, well, Danny, it's probably not going to do very well then, is it? Well, I'm out of here. Goodbye, everyone. Also, because the title's going to be random, it's also not going to do brilliantly. So, it's a slight change of tone for Business Place, but it does involve friendships that turn sour, public punch ups, lap dancing brides, late night poker, and the immortal phrase, you fing buggering shit bucket. Oh, I like that. On first glance, he looks a bit like a science teacher who runs a very quiet and calm classroom but you probably wouldn't want to risk getting him angry. A friend of mine once attended a posh party about 15 years ago where Sir Clive was one of the VIP guests. He must have done something right because they fucking knighted him, didn't they? I was gobsmacked when I first heard this news and settled back to hear the flow of inevitable anecdotes from this experience, but there weren't any. Apparently, Sir Clive just lingered in a corner all night and barely said a word to anybody. <laughs> But it was maybe the wrong crowd for Sir Clive, who seemed more at home in one of Peter Stringfellow's infamous nightclubs. Oh, these are... Isn't Str Stringfellow's is a, is a strip club, isn't it? By day, he was a man who fiddled around with circus and amplifiers, but at night, he turned into a disco dancing scientist who it's claimed would dance with the vigor of a prawn plugged into the mains. That is quite the analogy there. As you might expect, he was a bit of an odd child. Born Clive Marles Sinclair in 1940, he didn't always enjoy school and preferred the company of adults to his peers. Inspired by a puppet character called Mr. Inventor from the children's TV series Toy Town featuring Larry the Lamb, young Clive turned his hand to fiddling around with gadgets and by the age of 12, he had designed a one-man submarine. Sounds like a bit of a legend so far, if I'm honest. During his teenage years, when his peers would probably have been chuffed to bits at getting a letter printed in Eagle Comic, Clive had already got his first technical article published in Practical Wireless Magazine. His parents had assumed that he would go to university, and he certainly breezed through the qualifications. But Clive had been offered a holiday job uh, writing for the same Practical Wireless Magazine, and had convinced his parents that this had better prospects. And he was right. Shortly after he started work at the magazine, the editor retired through illness, and then the assistant editor buckled under the strain of stepping into his shoes. By the age of 18, Clive had found himself practically running the publication single-handedly. That is mighty impressive. After moving on to become assistant editor of Instrument Practice and writing a few books with such thrilling titles as Practical Transistor Audio Amplifiers for the Home Constructor, which sadly didn't make it onto the bestseller lists, Clive eventually... <laughs> What a shocker. Clive eventually raised enough money in the 1960s to start his own business in Cambridge, Sinclair Radionics. It sounds kind of radioactive. The company specialized in mail order miniature radios and audio amplifiers in kit form. I built one of these when I was a kid. Like, you could make, uh, what are they called, crystal radios or something. You'd solder all the little pieces together and it would make a little magical radio. It was great. I used to like doing electronics. I'd solder all this shit together. It was fun. You could make all these different little projects. 
I, I don't have hobbies anymore. As the name suggests, this was an absolutely tiny amplifier kit which hobbyists could put together in under two hours, and it was a fairly big success for the one-man mail-order company. But not every product was a hit, and the company developed a reputation of producing cheap and cheerful products that didn't always work terribly well. One customer was a young guy called Chris Curry, who had recently bought one of Clive's X10 PWM amplifier kits and found it to be a bit rubbish. Despite this, or who knows, maybe because of this, Chris Curry ended up accepting a job as an engineer for Sinclair Radionics in 1966. He would go on to develop a close friendship with his boss and would himself go on to be a key figure of the Cambridge computer boom, but more on that in a moment. In the meantime, Chris was happy to work alongside Clive, although he described his boss as an irask... Oh God, I don't know this word, irascible maybe, I'm not going to look it up and pretend that I'm smart. He was always a person, he was always charging up and down, shouting and throwing his slide rule around. There was always a new product to be developed, but Sinclair had a tendency to go for the lowest possible cost of assembly, often at a sacrifice to quality. Perhaps Sinclair Radionics' most notable success was the release of the Sinclair Executive Slimline cal Calculator in 1972. It always sounds better when it's executive, like, oh what's that, it's my executive desk. It's my executive cup. It's my executive penis. I don't know where that came from. <laughs> it delivered only very basic maths functions, and it cost a bomb to buy. 79 pounds, which would be over a grand in today's money. Mmm! For a calculator! <laughs> but it was one of the world's first ever portable pocket calculators, and it became something of a British status symbol. <laughs> the past was weird. It's like, what? <laughs> nice watch, nice car, nice calculator. <laughs> Woo! I got that money. It's like no one was wearing those ridiculous Gucci sweaters, <laughs> which is an OG business place legend joke. Um, God, those things are f***ing hideous, aren't they? But it's like they didn't have those. They just said calculators. Pimp. It's hard now to imagine how flashy would have looked in 1972 if you were sat in a pub and suddenly whipped out a pocket calculator and started entertaining everybody at the table with basic maths functions. I'd entertain them by the fact that you can make boobies. You could type in boobies, turn it upside down, you know? Woo! <laughs> that was a grand. Are you impressed? <laughs> this works with all the ladies. There were further flops to follow, including the Black Watch in 1975, which was a wildly expensive digital watch in kit form. The idea was that you needed to activate the watch every time you wanted it to display the time, but the problem was that the kit was almost impossible to put together. Also, the batteries only lasted 10 days, and they were a nightmare to replace. Sounds a bit like the Apple Watch, doesn't it? How innovative! I like it! So many were sent back to Sinclair for repair that it very nearly crippled the company, and the UK government's National Economic Board had to step in to save Sinclair Radionics from going bankrupt. Another big flop was the Microvision in 1977. Sir Clive had been passionate about the idea of inventing a tiny portable television and had been tinkering around with the concept for well over a decade. By 1977, it managed to secure a million pound grant from the National Research and Development Council, and the Microvision family finally went on sale for under a hundred pounds, or about 625 pounds in today's money. The problem was that Clive had grossly overestimated just how many people would be willing to spend that amount, of, that amount of money on a crap tiny TV. The company lost another fortune, and most of the microvisions ended up getting flogged for peanuts to people with exceptional eyesight. By nine, <laughs> but a bum bum. Uh, by 1979, Sinclair Radionics had evolved into Sinclair Research, and Clive had turned his beady eye to personal home computers. The next five years or so would see Clive spearhead a British revolution in the home computer industry during his brief golden period of glorious success. It may have, it's maybe a bit of a shame that the other 45 years of business weren't quite so great, so let's focus on the positives for now. Well, I hope we get to the negatives, because, I mean, all the, you know, business success, yay, it's so great, and woo, everyone's great. But, like, when you get to really rip into something, for some reason that is more entertaining. I don't know why. Humans. Schadenfreude. Clive's idea was to launch a programmable computer that everyday people could actually afford to buy. Bearing in mind that the only alternatives at the time were massively expensive, for expensive computers from Commodore, Apple, and Tandy, which could generally only be found in corporate offices, laboratories, and teaching establishments. The Sinclair ZX80 wouldn't win any awards for aesthetics. In fact, it looked a bit like a sawn-off typewriter, Jesus. Uh, but it only, it only contained one kilobyte of RAM, which would perhaps make a slight mockery of the marketing tagline, which claimed it could quite literally do anything from playing chess to running a power station. But the real selling point was that it only cost about £100 in kit form, or £150 a set in assembled form for people who like for people like me who didn't have the slightest clue of how to start putting it together. I'll be a bit disappointed with my computer, although, to be fair, <laughs> like, I made, I, I mean, I built my computer, with the help of a friend of mine, built the computer, 
because I wanted to choose all the parts. But I mean, I guess this shit had to be like soldered together. This wasn't much, uh, there wasn't much of a gaming scene around Clive's early computers, but that wasn't really the point, as Clive didn't have the slightest interest in silly games anyway. The whole idea was the families could have a computer in their home for the first time and learn how to write simple, basic programs. And the kids could quickly learn how to make the word boobies fill up the screen just a couple of, with just a couple of simple lines of code. Did Danny know about my earlier... Did, Danny did an unintended callback to my previous joke. Hero. The ZX80 sold around 50,000 units, but this paled in significance when compared to its successor, the Sinclair ZX81, released the following year. Despite the fact that this new machine really didn't have much to offer in way of improvements over the original, it managed to shift 1.5 million units. And how it did that is, uh, is going to be the focus of this business place right after I tell you about the legends at Dash Lane. In, the, in 19 whenever, they didn't have to worry about, you know, people stealing passwords, identity protection, all this bullshit. Because, like, it wasn't an issue. No one needed Dash Lane back then. And maybe it was a better time. Maybe it was better when no one was stealing all of our sh**. But the reality is, in 2020, there are people out there that f everything up. But look, hacking events, they go on all the time against some of the largest businesses in the world. You know this because, well, it often comes up in the news. It's like, oh, giant company got its data hacked and loads of people had their passwords. So I was like, oh, come on again. Why? What is clear is that the world's largest businesses do need to take security more seriously. Yes, they do. I fully agree, Dashlane. Because no, no one likes it when they get that email from like a random company that's like, yeah, by the way, just letting you know, we might have got hacked. And by might of, I mean we definitely did. So, oh, guys. <laughs> that being said, one of the weakest links in the security equation within any organization is employees' passwords. Yeah, I can believe it because everyone uses the same bloody password, don't they? You and I both know that it's hard to remember strong and unique passwords for every site. Oh, Dashlane. Uh, I'm not sure I agree with that because I find it very easy to remember my password of 173467321476 Charlie 32789777643 Tango 732Victor 731178887324767897643776 lock. But just in case you're not a robot sent from the future like me, well there's Dashlane and if you get that reference you absolute mega legend. Let me know in the comments below and go get dash lane come on that was hard <laughs> support the show look weak and reused passwords they present a risk of data breach that could potentially cost millions of dollars and significant reputational damage yeah like i said you get that email from that company and you're like i just don't trust you anymore <laughs> i just don't i'm never gonna buy things from you again by far one of the easiest ways for organizations to up their security game is dash lane's business offering mm -hmm. for as little as five dollars a month per user that's cheap if it's just you and that's really cheap if you're like a giant ass company. And you and your team can leverage Dashlane's patented security architecture to empower, I like that word, employees to create secure, unique passwords for all of their accounts, monitor password health, and quickly identify security events from one central dashboard. That sounds lovely. They make it easy to book business trips, manage multiple addresses and autofill payments by keeping company cards and financials accessible and secure for those who have access. I mean, I have personal Dashlane. Maybe I should get it for my business i'm just kidding it's like my business but look if you are a business you should probably get this because um yeah no one trusts companies that get hacked and it seems like you know your user passwords your employees passwords they're gonna suck give them dash lane why not if you're a business owner or part of an organization that would like to take advantage of the peace of mind the dash lanes offer the dash lane offers you can start with a free trial today for you and your team by heading to dashlane.com forward slash business and, uh, yeah, that's Dashlane, folks. Look, go get it done. Let us carry on. But the real game changer came with the arrival of the Sinclair ZX Spectrum in 1982. And I've talked about before how this was one of the greatest and most enduring machines of all time. I think this was the one that everyone really loved because they could play games on it. And Sir Clive was like, oh, this wasn't what I intended at all. It's supposed to be an educational tool. It's like, Clive, look, man, people like find other calculators. Like they play gate, you know, it writes boobies. It writes Bible. It writes hello. 
Look, we literally think of anything to do other than work. Clive, you should have thought about this. Um, despite the computer's limitations and its 48 kilobytes of memory for the superior model. Wait, Daddy, we said it didn't have any sort of significant upgrades, but it seems to have 48 times more memory. It did certainly manage to cram in plenty of magic within the small black casing. And the price tag of £175 is worth every penny. The sound capacity was largely limited to quiet beeping noises, yet this proved to be the enchanting soundtrack of the bedroom of many a mesmerized youth. And it was also one of the first computers to deliver a full color display, even if the colors unfortunately tended to bleed into each other, so that a character in a game would adopt the same color as the background that he was passing by and become very difficult to actually spot on the screen. <laughs> Sounds a bit shit, doesn't it? Can you imagine, like, they're just releasing these, like, new Xboxes, the PlayStation 5, and it's, like, 4K. If someone took a picture of it, you'd probably be like, yeah, it's a photograph. Like, <laughs> it's incredible. Even those, like, I play uh, GTA 5 with my friends sometimes, and it's like, it looks wild. It, you know, it's the game's, like, 10 years old now. It, I, I guess they've upgraded it and stuff like PC or whatever, but it's beautiful. I mean, when you, when you shoot people, you can really see the blood just out of their bodies and their heads. It's great. It really is like all violent video games that make you violent in real life. No, they don't, you idiots. <laughs> it's like number of people I've killed in GTA, thousands. Number of people I've killed in real life, fing zero. Allegedly. But from Sir Clive's perspective, the ZX Spectrum seemed started out life as a failure. It had originally intended to be seen as a serious programming computer, much like its predecessors. During the machine's development, the BBC had initiated a computer literacy project which would involve the Broadcasting Corporation trying to get more computers into schools. All the BBC needed was a suitable model for them to put their branding on and get it into classrooms, so they invited manufacturers to tender their bids. Clive felt sure that his new ZX Spectrum would be the only obvious contender for this project, and he felt the big bucks deal was already in the bag. It would have been a massive moment for Sinclair Research. Don't count your chickens before they've hatched, Clive. If we've learned anything from Business Blaze, it's that. You're welcome. Um, but there would turn out to be another serious contender, and it involved his former friend and associate, Chris Curry. Oh, Chris, you traitor! What have you done? Chris had left Sinclair by this point, <laughs> no surprises there, following a disagreement over which new computer models to develop, and he'd gone off for, uh, to form the Acorn Company, I've heard of that as well. Uh, just over the road from Sinclair's offices in Cambridge. Acorn at this point were developing their new Proton computer, and Chris felt that this new machine might just be what the BBC was looking for. It's believed that Clive Sinclair was so convinced that his new Spectrum would be chosen by the BBC that he began to display surprising levels of arrogance during the negotiations. That's not a good sign. Don't do that. Even if you're 100% sure you've got it in the bag, just assume you don't. It's always best to, because you know, it's better not to be disappointed. And look like a complete knobbo. When the BBC brought up the possibility of his company making modifications to the system, he point-blank refused. He was only offering them a chance to brand his ZX Spectrum in BBC colors, and that was the only deal on the table. Clive, they are the ones with the money. Uh, in contrast, Chris Curry and Acorn were willing and ready to work with the BBC on anything they requested. Acorn won the contract, and their Proton evolved into the BBC Micro, which ended up in the classrooms of every school in the UK. Now swamped with new orders for their machine, Acorn had won a major battle in the 80s computer war. This things reached a boiling point between Clive and Chris when Acorn subsequently released an advertisement which claimed, rather cheekily, that Sinclair computers were shoddy and unreliable. Wow, Chris? Clive? Chris? Yeah, Chris. That's a bit of a low blow. I mean, although, to be fair, like, wasn't Chris working there when everything was shoddy and unreliable? Allegedly. I hope there was a big allegedly on the bottom of the poster. It's like, <laughs> Sinclair computers are a bit shite. Allegedly. Uh, Chris Curry was enjoying a quiet pint in the Baron of Beef pub when he suddenly saw an enraged Clive Sinclair marching towards him, armed with a rolled up newspaper. This is going to be the most British fight ever. He just starts whacking him. With a now legendary Clive, you fing buggering sh bucket! Clive Sinclair started attacking his former friend and associate around the head with a newspaper in full view of the packed pub. They followed. <laughs> they followed. <laughs> it's the most British thing ever. <laughs> there followed a bit of angry pushing and shoving, and the debate still rages as to whether actual punches were thrown. Probably not. They're both like British Cambridge dudes and computer guys. They probably just shoved each other a little bit. It wasn't Clive's finest hour. I don't know about that. 
but he did later apologize and the two made up shortly afterwards. Uh, Clive said, He'd slagged off my computer and I took exception to that. It was nothing too vigorous. I think he was pretty shamefaced, but we soon patched things up and we remain friends. I'm not embarrassed about it. Yeah, you shouldn't be, Clive. Good for you. You defended your computer's honor. Uh, Acorn may have won a major battle, but they ultimately lost the war. One of the main problems with BBC Micro is that it was generally seen by the kids as a stiff and boring school computer. They would work on it during school hours and then they'd go home and play cool games on their Spectrums and their Commodore 64s. Chris Curry recalls walking into a local computer store and noticing with dismay that all the kids were excitedly hanging around the bulging shelves of games for these other computers, while a couple of titles for the BBC Micro were hidden away in a quiet corner of the shop. Yeah, because everyone loves games and no one loves work. We've discussed this. Acorn was taken over by an Italian company in 1985 and pretty much disappeared from the scene. Meanwhile, the ZX Spectrum shifted over 5 million units worldwide. So it all worked out well for Clive. That's nice. By this time, Clive Sinclair had become a bit of a British celebrity. On the advice of a failed ice cream inventor and convicted milk thief, Margaret Thatcher, he was awarded. I just did a video on biographics, my other channel, about biographies about Margaret Thatcher. It was interesting. Uh, I hope it was balanced. Margaret Thatcher is a very divisive subject in the UK. Uh, he was awarded a knighthood in 1983 for leading a renaissance of British industry, but he often appeared in the tabloid headlines for reasons that had little to do with his business. After divorcing his first wife, with whom he had three children, in 1985 Sir Clive was often photographed strutting his funky stuff in nightclubs. He was romantically attached to a long line of women, young enough to be his daughter, and his good friend Pete Stringfellow once revealed that Clive has a smooth way with the ladies. <laughs> this is not how I imagine this dude. But there we are. One notable relationship with was Angie Bowness, a former beauty queen turned tap dancer. Oh, lap dancer, that's a different thing. Clive first met her at a Stringfellow's nightclub where she charged him 10 quid for a lap dance and then he asked her out for a meal. In many ways, it sounded like a match made in microchip heaven. It did? Angie, Angie once remarked, he didn't use a lot of words that I'd never heard of. He's actually incredibly attractive to women, you can tell from the pictures. What is going on? But Angie also revealed the small quirks in her relationship with a man 36 years her senior. Pop music like All Saints. All I could find in his flat were classical CDs, and I like to watch TV. But he prefers to read, bo read books. <laughs> What a surprise. That's how I imagine the dude. Uh, despite these cultural differences, Angie ended up becoming Lady Sinclair when she later married Sir Clive, and the marriage would last seven years. 1985 was the year that Sir Clive launched the disastrous Sinclair C5 vehicle, a topic we've already covered in the Inventions Nobody Needed video. Yeah, this was like the... It was a ridiculous electric-powered tricycle or something that just seemed totally bad. I think I made a joke that if you got hit by a car, you'd just be missed afterwards because it just looked so bad. Oh, as the title of the video might suggest, the C5 was a laughable failure. Due to the fact that it looked absurd, it was a pain to drive, and you were likely to get mowed down by a truck if you ever did anything as foolish as taking it out on the road. Danny and I, unsurprisingly, on the same page here because we've covered it before. But following this mighty flop, Sir Clive turned his attention back to personal home computers, feeling probably a smart move there because, you know, you're good at that. Fe uh, feeling compelled to move away from the gaming scene in which he had zero interest, Sir Clive wanted to go back back to the roots of serious computers used for programming. He felt kind of embarrassed by his greatest invention, which was largely seen as a toy, and Clive craved more respectability with a proper computer. His knighthood wasn't enough. No one respects me. Clive, you were given a knighthood. People respect that shit, at least in the UK. Sort of, I think. I think they do. He originally predicted that the Sinclair QL would shift around 100,000 units per month, but the release of the machine was heavily delayed. At the official launch event, Clive was trying to generate orders for the machine that didn't even have a working prototype. When the QL was eventually unveiled, it would prove to be a massive damp squib with cheap technology and a crap disk drive. The fact that Clive had refused to produce any gaming software at all for the machine didn't help matters. This is what the audience wanted and what Clive had already reluctantly given them with the Z Spectrum. But he wasn't going down that path to riches again. Only 60,000 units were ever sold, and Sinclair Research lurched ever towards bankruptcy. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting, like, this Clive dude. He's like, he just assumes stuff's gonna be wildly successful. Which, I don't know, whenever I launch a new YouTube channel or do another video, I'm like, oh, it's gonna be a flop. It's not gonna work out. I mean, hopefully it will, but I just assume people are gonna hate it and not watch it. And it's nice when they do, rather than being like, this one, bigger than PewDiePie. Business Blaze, bigger than PewDiePie. Mega project? Mm. 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 The greatest! No, I just assume it's a bit. And then some people will be like, it's a bit. 
but most people seem to like it, which is nice. Both the Sinclair C5 and the Sinclair QL had been huge financial disasters for the company, which was now being propped up by continued sales of the old ZX Spectrum, and even these were starting to dry up as customers began looking towards the next generation. Sinclair Research was now in dire need of rescue. In 1985, the press announced that the fat fraudster Robert Maxwell had mounted a £12 million rescue bid for Sinclair, with the proposal being that Clive would stay on as life president and consultant, but Maxwell would effectively run the company with a new team. It's like, yeah, yeah, Clive, you're president for life. Get the f out. At the time, Sir Clive said he was tickled pink by the announcement, but the deal never happened. Some say that Maxwell later looked through the books and decided that it wasn't viable. <laughs> it's like, yeah, I'll give you 12 million pounds. Now I'd like to look at your accounts. <laughs> never mind. <laughs> Uh, others claim, others reckon that Clive was never remotely serious about the deal, and it was all just a plot to try and calm the nerves of panicked investors. Either way, Robert Maxwell skulked off back to his big, expensive yacht for a date with Destiny. Ah, oh, of course, he's the fat dude that fell off the boat in the previous videos. Sinclair Research limped along into 1986 when it received a new offer from Alan Sugar and his Amstrad company. Alan Sugar. He's our equivalent of Donald Trump, except less successful, and that's saying something. And he once, I believe he once said there's no money in software or something. And uh, he just went into hardware, and that's why he runs, runs Amstrad, and Bill Gates runs Microsoft. <laughs> or used to run Microsoft, now he just gives away all his money and people hate him for it for some reason. F idiots. Now more widely known as the host of the UK version of The Apprentice, back then, Sugar was better- smash that dislike button by the way. Uh, I saw an episode where Bill Gates is being interviewed about the coronavirus vaccine, and it's mostly dislikes. It's like 60% dislikes, and he's just talking about how he's giving money away. And they're like, he's injecting us with microchips! He is not a health expert, what does he know? And it's like, I don't know, he's just giving away money. He's he's employing experts to tell him things, and he's, he's incredibly smart. F it hell. And now this video will have like a higher percentage of dislikes because there are f***ing crazy people. Shut the f*** up. God f damn. The meeting held between Sir Clive and Alan Sugar in a Japanese karaoke restaurant must have been an intriguing clash of cultures. Sir Clive was the quiet, softly spoken inventor, while Alan Sugar was the loud, working class cockney who spoke his mind. Clive later described Alan as delightful, very pleasant company. A witty man. Alan wasn't so kind in his response, taking the piss out of Clive's carefully cultivated Etonian accent and intellectual pretensions. But a deal was struck that day, which involved Amstrad buying the rights to the Sinclair brand. Yeah, I mean, <coughs> to be fair, what do you expect? The guy who's like super proper and polite, even if he thanks, thinks Alan Sugar is a prick, which he probably did, he's gonna be like, oh, yes, delightful chap. Yes, jolly good. Really enjoyed my lunch with him. Excellent. Jolly good old bean. And Alan Sugar be like, he's a bit of a wasn't he? <laughs> Even though in Clive Sinclair's mind, he's like, what a knob. Allegedly. Um, b -b 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 but a deal was struck that day which involved Amstrad buying the rights to the Sinclair brand and the existing Sinclair products for £16 million, while Sir Clive was allowed to spin off Sinclair Research as a small research and consultancy company. Interestingly, the one existing Sinclair product that was not included in the deal with Amstrad was the Sinclair C5. But I'm sure Sir Alan didn't have too many qualms about that. Alan Sugar naturally dropped the Sinclair QL after he bought the rights to Sinclair, but he continued to produce pimped up versions of the old ZX Spectrum, which extended the shelf life of the machine for another few years. But it was never quite the same again, and the golden age of Sinclair was well and truly over. During the 1990s, Sir Clive's new research company had shrunk to just himself and two employees. By the end of the decade, he was working completely alone again, just as he had started out with Sinclair Radionics in the 1960s. He later seemed more interested in poker than products, propping, popping up as a celebrity guest on the UK's late night poker TV show and attending major professional tournaments around the world. His biggest ever recorded win was $30,000 and he's currently ranked 57,454th on the all-time earners list. I'm guessing that's not where he made the majority of his money. But although he's pissed about a bit with new electric bikes, he's still alive? Kind of assumed he was dead. <laughs> there we go. Which look alarmingly like the old Sinclair C5 and sea scooters and wheelchair drive unit, Sir Clive has remained largely under the radar since the 1980s. So under the radar, I assumed he was dead. Uh, today, he doesn't have much truck with the internet or modern computers. He says, our machines were lean and efficient. The sad thing is that today's computers totally abuse their memory, totally wasteful. You have to wait for the damn thing to boot up, just appalling designs. Absolute mess, so dreadful it's heartbreaking. <laughs> this guy sounds like Donald Trump. Totally wasteful. Absolute mess. So dreadful.
Considering just how much power and magic Sir Clive managed to cram into that 48 kilobit spectrum, you kind of do see his point a bit. Yeah, I know. I know. Why do things take so long to load? Why? <laughs> Come on. Come on. I just never turn my computer off from solved. You know, it's only having after written this script that I'm beginning to think that Sir Clive was less of a hero and more of a hopeless dick in so many ways. I knew I should have gone with Yoko on the topic for this one. Ah! Danny makes another callback to a joke that I made. Incredible. <laughs> His problem seemed to be that he devoted most of his resources into things that nobody really wanted, such as tiny TV sets and crap electric tricycles. His one crowning glory was something that seemed to embarrass him, and after scoring huge, almost accidental success and acclaim with the ZX Spectrum, he ran away and designed more stuff that nobody wanted, like a serious computer without any games. No one wants a serious computer, Clive. It's all about the games. If only he had followed trends a little more carefully, and he would be a billionaire by now, and the British com computer industry might have not fallen so quickly to American giants such as IBM and Microsoft and Apple. Alas, oh, we've got Amstrad though, don't we? <laughs> the UK computer giants that dominated the scene of the 1980s have long since driven off into the sunset, presumably on a battered old Sinclair C5 with a knackered battery. But a boom, boom. This has been Business Blaze. I have been your boy with the Blaze. This video was sponsored by our friends over at Dashlane, so please do check them out. Link below, and thank you for watching. It's like, yeah, yeah, Clive, you're president for life. Get the f.